Uh, welcome to virtual Copenhagen. I'm actually in Berkeley. Uh, I took ill and uh, was unable to travel. Uh, so I'm giving this talk by video, thanks to the assistance of Julian and others. Um, I'm here today to tell you about uh, work that I did about a year ago uh, that's going to continue soon. Uh, this is work uh, that was done in conjunction with people uh, in Berkeley at the university and also the Intel Research Lab here uh, to do uh, long distance wireless using commodity wireless parts. Anyway, um, the background behind this talk is that um, basically in emerging regions uh, installing infrastructure uh, for internet access and other uses is actually quite expensive and in some cases totally infeasible. Uh, you can't imagine trying to drive a a backhoe in some of these places and <clears throat> the cost would be prohibitive and in some cases there's just simply not funding in order to do it. So people have been looking for a long time given the availability of commodity wireless parts for ways to leverage that technology to provide IT infrastructure in emerging regions. Um, this this uh, application is actually quite enabling to people. It can uh, significantly change their lives in ways that you may not consider. Uh, some of the cases that have been studied and, and actually uh, made real involve doing things like providing people with voice over IP telephony uh, between villages in Africa where they've never been able to communicate with their siblings uh, except by actually physically visiting. In other places such as India, uh, there are uh, test beds that have been installed for doing uh, uh, diagnosis, medical diagnosis over wireless links uh, between places where uh, people simply aren't able to uh, to travel. So uh, the ability to do long distance wireless is actually turning out to be a really important uh, piece of development work which is showing up in the emerging regions and uh, <clears throat> and the work that I, I was doing with the people at Berkeley that I'm going to talk about today uh, discusses uh, work that we did to try and take some of this research work that was done by the UC Berkeley people and turn it into some more uh, production quality uh, devices. So first I'm going to start telling you about, uh, in order to tell you about the work that I did, you have to understand something about the TIER project. The TIER project stands, TIER stands for Technology uh, Infrastructure for Emerging Regions. <clears throat> and it's a project, as I said, a joint project between UC Berkeley and the Intel Research Lab. It's actually been going on for several years. It's a multi, uh, multi, uh, uh, organizational group uh, that involves not only uh, computer science people but also people in, in other uh, uh, curriculum. And the TIER project has a specific goal uh, which they say is to address the challenges of basically deploying IT infrastructure in emerging regions. And TIER has been going on as I said for several years. There's an awful lot of information about uh, the TIER project itself and about their, <coughs> their results uh, that you can get on the web and I provided you with the URL uh, so you can locate that. And you should definitely do that because it has a lot of papers uh, both published and uh, in related to the wireless work but also related to the deployments and the experiences that have been received from doing the uh, tests. Anyway, as part of TIER, um, <clears throat> the wireless infrastructure work that they did uh, came about and they coined a term called WildNet, which stands for Wi-Fi based long distance networking. And that project, uh, as you can see, is focused on taking the commodity 8 to 11 parts that are now uh, as cheap as a, a dollar or less per part, <clears throat> and using that to build uh, systems that people can use to tie together uh, and provide an IT infrastructure in these regions where it's not been feasible in the past. So. The, the two key aspects, uh, the two key developments that are driving this work, or have driven this work, are the availability of commodity parts <coughs> and the fact that these commodity parts work in the unlicensed spectrum. So uh, one thing that you can't lose sight of is that while uh, 802.11 infrastructure may be possible, it also has to be deployable. And for that to happen, uh, the people who are doing it can't have, uh, must not have to pay for licensing fees to actually run their wireless networks. So, <clears throat> so the first question, of course, that you're going to ask is, what is long distance? So when I talk about long distance, um, first you have to understand that 802.11 as a specification was designed for indoor use mostly. 
Uh, there have been some applications in the outdoor arena, but for the most part, uh, the specification is designed for using with uh, for use with access points and stations, laptops uh, that are uh, separated by probably at most 100 feet. Um, typically, it's even less. Um, but in our uh, deployments, what we're looking at doing is is using the same technology uh, to set up mostly point-to-point -point links <coughs> that are uh, typically on the order of 30 kilometers and often 100 kilometers or more. And as you'll see, we've actually been able to do some pretty astounding tests. So, uh, given this requirement that we be able to uh, run 802.11 networks over very long distances, what are the challenges? Well, the first key challenge, the first thing that you need to understand, and, and I'm not sure how many people are familiar enough with the 802.11 protocols and how the MAC layer uh, that controls access to the medium works. But uh, the MAC itself is not well designed for running at long distances. Uh, wireless networks based on 802.11 use um, a mechanism which is very similar to wired Ethernet, uh, CSMA, Carrier Sense Multiple Access, um, which allows multiple stations basically to contend for access to the medium and people uh, or uh, devices that want to get on the network uh, listen or uh, wait for basically a lull in the energy spectrum <coughs> in the signal to drop uh, and they use that as an indication that the medium is is idle and free, potentially free, and they can get in and uh, start transmitting. Um, when you have stations separated by huge distances um, in the propagation delay between these stations may be so large that you may not be able to uh, deal with having uh, the time required in order to listen uh, for, an idle, for an idle network. So uh, basically it takes too long and you may have to sit there for a very long time waiting for things to appear idle. So uh, the 802 MAC layer itself um, really isn't suitable. Um, you can uh, tweak various uh, parameters such as uh, timeouts and so on to make it usable up to a particular distance, but at some point uh, the fact that you really have to uh, deal with stations taking a very long time to actually propagate data from one point to another, just the physical transfer of that uh, energy, uh, dominates the process and you're not able to make effective use of the medium if you continue to use the 802.11 MAC layer design. <coughs> so this, this, this problem um, is commonly termed the hidden node problem, which is that uh, when nodes are very distant, uh, you can't hear them, and so it appears as if they're hidden, like behind a wall or something. And uh, so people who have looked at this problem um, have looked at various solutions, and one of the common ones is the one that I'm going to talk about today, which is TDMA, which is an alternative to the standard MAC layer. Now another thing to understand is that at large distance separation, other factors come into play that don't normally show up in a uh, close setting. So when you have a laptop and an AP close by, you may have interference from things like microwave ovens and so on, uh, interfering uh, sources. Uh, but <clears throat> And you may even have other interfering uh, or uh, difficulties such as multipath, uh, where the signal that from one, sent, from one transmitter to a receiver bounces off uh, objects that distort and um, relay the signal. Uh, but when you're talking about very long distances, uh, you have other uh, interference sources that appear and you also have to worry about things like the curvature of the earth and you have to worry about, <clears throat> in particular, about the environmental factors uh, such as uh, rain and, and depending on the uh, uh, frequency at which you're working uh, and operating, uh, there are other factors as well. So. So, um, anyway, so the challenges uh, for these long-distance networks are great. Uh, in fact, there may be a few others that you may not notice uh, or that you may not be aware of. Uh, in fact, uh, here's an example of one which was uh, quite surprising. Uh, this is a deployment at Arvin in, in India, which where the uh, telemedicine, uh, the tier people set up a telemedicine network. And it turns out that every morning, so they have, they have radios, um, uh, there should be a monkey climbing, not a money climbing. Oh, sorry, thanks. <laughs> I'll have to fix that. Um, so the, uh, it turns out that every morning uh, they have their, they have their long-distance wireless parts uh, mounted on these huge towers. And the gardener told them that every morning 
uh, this monkey would climb the tower and and get up to the radio and and pull on the connectors. <laughs> he would jiggle the radio and the antennas. And so um, when you're when you're deploying these things in in way out of the way locations, there are these unexpected uh, uh, factors that you have to take into account. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about the system that we build. <clears throat> so anyway, um, so now that I've told you a little bit about what it's like in terms of trying to do this long distance networking, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the approaches that were taken both by the tier people in our, in our group uh, to develop uh, solutions and workarounds for these problems. Um, as I said, the 802.11 MAC layer is not suitable for use in long distances. Um, instead, uh, what we've done is we've replaced the MAC with a TDMA implementation. TDMA meaning time division multiplex access and basically it's just a, a time sliced access uh, fixed scheduling mechanism for gaining access to the medium. So uh, if you have two stations that are transmitting each one of them gets a slot and that slot is fixed relative to the other and at that point in time when the slot begins they're allowed to start trans uh, transmitting. Yes. So as a member of the audience, um, how wide are the slots and how do you keep them synchronized over a 100 kilometer zone? Right, so the, the hard part about TDMA is that uh, you have to keep the slots synchronized. And I'll talk a little bit about that, although that's, come of the, that's, that's part of the, the trickiness. That the synchronized from whose point of view? Right, so the slots have to be synchronized uh, so that you don't have overlap, because when you have overlap you have collisions and packet loss. Uh, the other question, uh, the other one of the other issues which Julian brought up was this question of uh, how wide are the slots? Because if the slots are very long, then uh, and if the, and if one side isn't transmitting, then that slot is basically idle. So, uh, in order to effectively use the medium uh, for bidirectional communication in a TDMA network, you really want the slots as short as possible, so that you have low latency um, and and you have effective use of the channel. Um, and, and these are trade-offs that you have to make in terms of designing the TDMA implementation, and we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that. So given TDMA, um, the, uh, the other aspect of the 802.11 networking uh, protocol uh, that we've discarded is that by not using the MAC, uh, we don't actually, each frame in an 802.11 network is actually acknowledged. So the receiver acknowledges each transmit and if the transmitter doesn't get an ACK in a sufficient amount of time, then it retransmits the packet up to a certain number of times. Um, we've actually uh, dropped that mechanism um, since you don't want to, since you have to, you would have to schedule the ACKs in the next slot, it wouldn't be feasible and you don't want to uh, slow down the network to a synchronous operation, operating mechanism. So instead, <clears throat> uh, what the tier people have done is they've actually added a mechanism for doing bulk act, bulk acknowledgement of packets. So you can send multiple packets in a, in a slot, in a TDMA slot, and then you can acknowledge all of them at once in the next slot. And the transmitter can use those bulk acts to decide whether it wants to retransmit some or all of its packets. Um, it turns out, uh, we can talk about some later if there's time, um, that uh, you can effectively just ignore acts and uh, allow higher level protocols like TCP to do the acknowledgements for you. Uh, that works up to a point. If you start having high packet loss, uh, TCP needs to be aware of that and needs to use uh, particular algorithms that are different than normally used in order to effectively uh, recover from lost packets in an environment where uh, you might have this sort of configuration. Another thing that tier people have done, uh, which uh, we have not done, but which I'll just mention, is that they've added error correction using a forward error correction technique. Um, you'll read about these, if you go to the tier website and look at some of the papers, um, this is all discussed in their papers. Uh, we're still looking at uh, whether it's uh, needed to add uh, forward error correction to our system. So. Uh, aside from the protocol, as I said, uh, part of the hard part of building these sorts of systems is actually the system design. Um, given a long distance to uh, transport packets from one end to the other, uh, you actually need quite a bit of energy to direct those, uh, direct those packets. And one of the things which has enabled uh, the low-cost deployment of, of these systems is the fact that uh, you can actually buy radios that are very high power 
these days. Um, so you have a high transmit power, which means that you can actually communicate from one end to the other over, over a, a great distance. Um, there are alternatives. You can always just use external power amps and high gain antennas. And in fact, high gain antennas are an important thing to use regardless of whether you're using an external power amp or a high power transmitter. Uh, but the advent of high power transmit uh, radio cars uh, has again lowered the cost of entry and made these sort of systems uh, feasible in places where they weren't before. Uh, now one thing that you need to understand is a lot of people say I just want high transmit power but you really need to be able to hear at the other end. So even though you have these high transmit power cards, uh, receive sensitivity which is the other end of the equation is really critical and as we'll see um, we chose cards that were based uh, almost entirely on the receive sensitivity because the high transmit power as I said is really an effective way simply to lower the cost of the system by eliminating the external power amps. <coughs> the last thing to understand is that um, the signaling technique that you use in order to do long distance wireless uh, matters quite a bit. Um, this, is a, this is related both to the frequency in which you're working and also to the environmental aspects. Uh, it turns out that OFDM and CCK, which are the two main signaling techniques, have different characteristics and you have uh, different success rates uh, dependent on the environment and the setup. Uh, OFDM is higher rate, higher transmit rate, and so uh, more efficient, uh, but in certain cases CCK is more useful. So, Is it <clears throat> possible to dynamically select between them? Um, you can, in fact, most of the radios can switch back and forth, um, but that actually significantly complicates uh, the design of the TDMA implementation. So in practice what you do with TDMA is you want to use a fixed transmit rate um, because, uh, and this is, this is one of the interesting results, is that if you actually try and do variable transmit rate rate control over a TDMA slotted network, um, you get into some very bad behaviors. And the ability to uh, schedule the packets requires that you be able to tell ahead of time what the transmit rate is so you can calculate the time that's going to take over the air. And so if you start varying the transmit rate, you can actually get yourself into trouble. Um, <coughs> it makes things much more difficult. So we go with a fixed transmit rate. And so typically what you do is, is once you've got things set up um, and you've got things working and effective, um, you really don't need to vary the parameters significantly unless something dramatic changes in your environment. At least that's based on our experience. So another aspect of the system design is that you need to pick frequency. Um, the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum is unlicensed and that's effectively where a lot of people want to operate. So of course it's very crowded. Um, now in the environments that we're talking about, the places where out in the middle of nowhere there's nothing there, um, that's really not an issue. Uh, however, if you're, in, um, if you're in locales where the spectrum's regulated and people are very sensitive to usage, um, you may be forced off 2.4 into other areas and in fact you want to, in some cases, move off of 2.4 because you have uh, different operating characteristics. Uh, for example, uh, if you have obstacles and so on. Uh, 900 megahertz, for example, is much more effective. Uh, but if you operate a 900 megahertz range uh, in some places where you have GSM for cell use, cellular telephone use, uh, people get very, very upset. <coughs> so uh, what we've done in terms of our system design is we've tried to build systems that are very flexible in terms of being able to operate in, in many different frequency spectrums, uh, parts of the spectrum, and uh, you can pick and choose uh, according to the requirements of that setup. So, so um, I've talked a lot about tier. Uh, I'm now going to start talking about the project that I worked on, which is an offshoot of tier. So the tier project was a research project, as I said, um, UC Berkeley and Intel Research. The, the uh, Intel Research people wanted to do a, uh, a more production-oriented version of this system and make it available in real deployments um, that uh, they, were, um, they were going to set up. <clears throat> and so I became involved and I also worked with the tier people as well. But, um, so we shared a lot of research results. But the RCP project is uh, called the Rural Connectivity Platform and it's an offshoot of tier, as I said, that was funded by the Intel research people. And its goals are shown here, the main one being that it's uh, production quality and that it be uh, self-configuring and automatically configuring. Uh, when you're trying to set up these systems out in the middle of nowhere, 
Um, you really want to take a box that you can strap on a mast, stick it up 100 feet, have it turn, you know, turn it on, and not have to do anything whatsoever. I mean, if you have to sit around and fiddle with stuff, uh, you're just going to go nuts. And in some cases, it, it, it's going to be impossible to get things to work right. So we uh, designed a system that was intended to be uh, very uh, hands-off and auto-configuring, and um, the results are sort of mixed, but that was the main goal. Uh, so this is a picture of an RCP box uh, sitting on a mast. It's uh, connected to the back of the antenna, um, and you can see, um, possibly, hopefully you can see when the slides are shown, uh, that it's got uh, directional or uh, omni antennas sitting off the bottom, um, use, which are used for uh, a local access point, um, which we'll talk about. Um, so you can set it up remotely, that is, uh, standing on the ground without being connected to the top of the mast, uh, to configure the thing wirelessly from a laptop. Uh, but then it has multiple ports, so you can talk. You can connect the box to the uh, directional antennas, which are used for the long distance wireless. <coughs> so the prototype system <coughs> is based on off-the-shelf hardware. Um, we used the GateWorks Avila board. Uh, it's an X-scale processor, has memory, flash, um, all the things you expect. It has two uh, power over Ethernet ports for wired Ethernet. Um, this is a special build that we did so that both ports are, wire, are, P, are PoE. That was actually very critical. One of the things that we learned, the tier people mostly work with Socrus ports, and one of the things they learned was not having all the ports PoE powered uh, was uh, waiting to shoot yourself in the foot. So if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you plug the power cable in the wrong port and you blow your board up, um, you're really, really unhappy. You may not have spare parts. Um, also, if you're trying to climb a la if you're climbing a ladder and you're at the top of a tower 100 feet up and you're trying to figure out, you know, in, in bright sunshine, which port is the powered one, and you're sticking a cable in, is it this one or that one? You you know you're going to get it wrong. So one of the small things that we did was that we made both ports uh, PoE powered, um, PoE set up. Um, the other thing that we did is that uh, the boards are built with uh, extreme temperature parts. Uh, so that they can uh, exist in the environments we're talking about putting them. Um, this adds cost to the platform. Uh, as I said, these are just um, test uh, builds that we've done for uh, trials. Um, if we were to go to a production build, um, we would cost reduce all this stuff. Um, the boards that we have have uh, four slots, four mini PCI slots in them. Um, you can get them with as uh, few as one and as much as four. Um, we used Atheros radios exclusively uh, for doing the wireless. And in particular, um, <coughs> we used uh, mostly high-power Atheros cards. Um, you're you're hard-pressed basically to find high-power radios with any other uh, parts associated with them. You can get uh, the old Prism cards with 200 milliwatts, but uh, these are 400 milliwatts or sometimes more. Uh, cards. Um, the main card we use is a Wistron card, the DMCA82, which is actually a dual band card. Um, there's trade-offs in terms of uh, how much transfer power you can get and the quality of the radio, uh, the effective quality. Uh, if you go with a dual band solution, you actually are forced into a lower power solution. Uh, Ubiquity, uh, their original uh, line of cards, uh, the SR cards, uh, has since been replaced by their XR cards. Um, they tend to be higher power uh, because they're single band solutions. Um, we also sometimes use low power uh, cards uh, mostly for access points, uh, local access point control. Um, but for the most part what you want to do is you want to have a box uh, which has uh, replaceable cards so that if one fails you can swap over to the other. So uh, this also ties into the question of uh, a, a very uh, um, little thought of issue, which is that the, uh, the connectors on the cards have to be compatible because uh, you, you have people, typically you want these boxes set up ahead of time and you just hand someone a box and tell them to mount it on a pole or put up a mast or run on a tower or something like that. But inevitably these things get jiggled and bumped and you have to open up the box and you have to reseat the connectors or you have to reseat the, the cards or you have to reseat the connectors from the cables and you need these things to be uh, compatible so that you can swap cables around. 
Now, there, there's some other aspects I'm not going to get into. Um, we, we did some physical design um, and some decisions so that you can do things like uh, know exactly what radio goes with what connector um, by using conventions and so on. Um, but the thing to learn uh, that we learned from this is that uh, you really want uh, cards with MMCX connectors uh, not only for the uh, lower injection loss on the cables, on the pigtails, uh, but also for the more uh, for being more robust. Oh, the the other thing I wanted to mention is that initially uh, we used a different card, <coughs> which turns out uh, was supposed to be rated as a high power card, and turned out to not pan out. Um, so you really have to be uh, skeptical of vendor claims about high power radios. Um, and in fact, you, you, we, we've done bench testing of all the cards and, uh, you know, you, you, before you build a system, you know, you need to build one in the lab, test it with a, with a power meter and a spectrum analyzer and see exactly what you're getting. Um, these systems are, are often very finicky. Um, you can <clears throat> have significant loss uh, just in the construction, uh, both from the cards, the connectors, the antennas, everything. So um, it's, it's sometimes very tricky. So um, I'm going to, I'm probably running low on time, is that true? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the software in the system, um, we, the, the software, uh, the systems we built use Linux. Um, we have a custom distribution, okay. Um, it's very stripped down and specific to our needs. Uh, the wireless support was all done uh, custom, uh, although it's all leveraging open source software. Um, and we did auto configuration from, the, from scratch, um, so the, the RC scripts and all the other things are, are set up uh, specific to our installations. Um, we have a web GUI. Um, most of the configuration work is done over the web, usually by wireless, uh, to, the, to an access point card, which is in the box, or it could be wired. Uh, a wired connection. <clears throat> and we try and make it as painless as possible because we know that once people uh, are left with the boxes, um, they're, they're going to be technical in some, at some level, but uh, not highly technical. And so they need a, a web-based or a GUI-based interface in order to maintain and configure the systems. But the goal on most of these system, on all these systems, is to really be self-maintaining. So there's a lot of logging and remote access mechanisms. Um, one of the important things that we did was that um, we spent a lot of time making sure that the uh, field upgrade mechanism was, was seamless and reliable, uh, both in terms of uh, upgrading forward and rolling back in case of problems. Um, when you have these boxes mounted up 100 feet up a tower, um, you don't want to have to go up the tower in order to swap compact flashcards or something similar. So these systems really have to work, they have to be reliable, and they have to be maintainable remotely. The, the network design is, is um, not real interesting. It's uh, a backbone uh, which is bridged at level two and uh, then overlaid on top of that is a routed network. So you can think of this in terms of uh, the long distance point-to-point -point links which are wireless are all bridged and then uh, in the locale uh, like in a village, um, you have people hooked in uh, through a variety of means, either through access points or uh, wired connections and so on. And all the traffic uh, there, uh, the people get uh, IP addresses through DHCP, they get a DNS name dynamically. Um, it all gets uh, pushed around over the, the network as a whole and, <clears throat> and traffic is routed. Um, early on, we had a purely bridged network and the feedback we got from trials that we did was that routing was just critical. So we switched to a, a bridge backbone with a routed overlay and that's turned out to be uh, pretty good uh, so far. Uh, it, the most important thing is that it allows for internet traffic uh, to operate uh, well um, without having the backbone up. So uh, other issues uh, that we had to make sure that we consider in our design. Uh, you have to have quality of service um, so that uh, things like vo uh, voice over IP phones, video conferencing and so on um, can operate well even when people are surfing the web. Oh, so that as, just to go back again to this issue of internet versus internet, um, 
people seem to lose sight of this when they when they talk about deploying infrastructure in emerging regions. They have, they seem to think in terms of well, these people, you know, we're going to give them the internet. Well, it turns out that most of the people have no interest whatsoever in going out to the internet. What they really want to do is they want to talk to their friends in their in neighboring villages. Okay, so intranet traffic, that is traffic within a, a deployment in a geographical area, is, is far more critical and important to be reliable than uh, being able to get out through the one satellite connection uh, to the internet and so on. So, so in terms of wireless design uh, for the system, now this is the RCP, uh, this is not uh, tier. Um, we have uh, a forked version of bad Wi-Fi. Um, I took the Mad Wi-Fi is the Linux version of the Athera support that I worked on a while back. <clears throat> we started working with that a while, uh, several years ago, and uh, at some point, uh, with all the changes that we had for doing TDMA and other other issues, uh, fixing other problems, uh, we ended up uh, diverging significantly from the public code base, um, and so we ended up forking. Um, it's been too difficult to back merge the changes. Uh, due to the evolution of the code at SourceForge, or not SourceForge, at MadWiFi.org. So a lot of these changes haven't gone back. Um, at some point it may be feasible to try and return some of these fixes, but um, they're probably pretty meaningless at this point in time. <coughs> the software that we ship, that we deploy in the field, uh, uses the public HAL uh, for Atheros cards. Uh, we do not have any private changes anywhere except in the driver. Um, the TDMA is done entirely with the public HAL, and uh, I made a lot of effort. I put a lot of effort into the HAL in order to make sure that all the hardware mechanisms that were needed were exposed. So anything that I've done, anyone else can do. There's there's nothing magic here. Um, in terms of the wireless stuff, uh, a lot of work was done to add support for high power cards, um, and also for the cards that operate in different spectrums, uh, different frequencies. Um, I made changes to the HAL. For example, for the 900 megahertz cards that everyone now has. Uh, the TDMA stuff we've talked about, I'm going to talk some more. Um, the other thing that you have to uh, do for systems like this is if you have a, a system with multiple radios in there and it's acting as a relay, um, you have to be able to uh, scan, um, you have to be able to scan over multiple radios and make decisions that are based on information you get back from all the radios. So rather, for scan, rather than scan for neighbors, for example, over one radio, uh, you have to be able to scan over multiple radios because you may be able to hear a neighbor or see a neighbor uh, when you scan uh, over, over both your radios, for example, and you want to be able to pick the radio which has the strongest signal. So uh, the ability to scan and uh, correlate results over multiple radios is really important. And uh, I did that, and it all operates in user mode. Uh, there's no kernel involvement whatsoever. And again, these are things that you can do uh, yourself. Uh, the other aspect is the tie into the auto configuration system. So it's not very interesting. So TDMA, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do uh, and how we do it. Um, once again, TDMA is time division multiplex access. So what we're doing is we're uh, dividing up access based on time. So every station in your TDMA network gets a slot of time and you're allowed to transmit only in that time. On all other, at all other times, you're listening and receiving traffic from other stations in the network. Um, the tier people implemented TDMA using Click, which is a modular uh, system which is layered on top of Linux and other systems. Um, Click is a really great research tool. It allows you to build a lot of interesting things. Um, but it's like a C++ nectar. <clears throat> yeah. But tier, uh, uh, click rather, uh, places some restrictions on what you can do in terms of TDMA. So, for example, uh, uh, in order to know whether, uh, in order to do scheduling properly, uh, they, they can't queue multiple packets to the driver simultaneously. It's basically a synchronous uh, API. Um, so, click wasn't considered uh, when we did our stuff. Instead, um, what I've done is I've uh, gone directly down into the hardware. And I'm using all the hardware mechanisms uh, to implement TDMA directly. Um, that's very efficient. Um, it turns out that we can do some really interesting things with it. Um, <clears throat> it also means that uh, you have uh, zero overhead in the host for doing TDMA. Um, and it also means um, that you can get very accurate timing uh, and results. Um, 
One of the fringe benefits of having the hardware do all this is that uh, the driver uh, requires very few changes um, and the TDMA operation on the uh, sort of over the air is transparent to all the software above. So for example, all of the QoS hardware scheduling, uh, scheduling that's done at hardware, um, all the other mechanisms all just work um, over top of TDMA. Um, one, of the, one of the nice results from using the hardware um, is that uh, we're able to get very high channel utilization. That is that um, the amount of time that you spend uh, potentially transmitting on the channel is, is very good. So uh, we don't have a lot of idle time that we, use, that we need to wait for things to happen or synchronize things to happen. That's one of the difficulties that uh, the tier people have with Click is that um, they need to wait for events to take place. Things are more synchronous. Um, because we use the hardware directly, uh, I'm able to get 70% uh, or greater channel utilization in a two-slot network. Um, the slot configuration uh, is dependent on the hardware that you have. Um, not all Atheros Macs are the same. Uh, you can't use all Atheros Macs to do this. You have to find uh, ones that are a uh, certain rev or later. Um, uh, I don't recall exactly which rev it is. Um, but uh, you're also limited by the hardware capabilities. Um, so when you're calculating time slots, um, the granularity of the timers, the hardware timers, comes into play. And uh, you're limited in terms of how accurate you can be and how much of a slop you have to throw in uh, for a guard interval to ensure that the slots don't overlap and slide and collide with each other. What do you mean by two times ten milliseconds? Okay, so um, the typical configuration is a two station network, point to point. Okay, so two times ten millisecond slots means that the typical configuration we use is for a point to point network you have uh, two slots that are alternating use. So each station gets to uh, uh, transmit uh, uh, round robin and those slots are, are ten milliseconds apiece. So uh, a station gets to transmit for 10 milliseconds, then it listens for 10 milliseconds. Transmit for 10 milliseconds, listen for 10 milliseconds. Um, we can go down as low as 1 millisecond, um, but uh, which reduces the uh, latency uh, because if you, you know, if you have packets to transmit and you don't fit in the slot, you have to wait for the next slot to come around to transmit. Um, however, um, uh, due to the granularity of the hardware timers, uh, the slots actually have to grow a little bit in order to uh, deal with round off in the calculations um, because of the timer granularity and you also have to take into account propagation delay between the stations so um, the effective uh, slot time grows so um, what you want to do is you want to find a sweet spot basically a balance between the slot size the slot length and um, and the effective use that you can get and what we found is that uh, 10 millisecond slots work pretty well um, you don't get uh, extreme latency on traffic. So for example, TCP is not significantly affected uh, by having this scheduling. Um, but you can get very effective uh, channel utilization. As I said, uh, some of the, uh, most of the tests I've done, um, I've done uh, on a wired test bed uh, using a link emulator uh, that simulates noise, multipath, and uh, other uh, environmental effects and uh, I use a two slot 10 millisecond uh, configuration um, typically uh, with 24 megabits OFDM um, because that's the highest power transmit capability for the radio um, and we can get uh, channel utilization which is about uh, 17 megabits per second or more so that's uh, an effective 70 percent utilization of the channel so uh, that's both sides transmitting as fast as they can so, uh, the other important uh, issue when you're doing a TDMA network, of course, is that you need your slots synchronized so that you need the clocks uh, scheduled so that uh, you don't transmit while somebody else is transmitting at the same time because otherwise you get collisions. Um, we are not listening for carrier. Um, we simply jump on the air and transmit when we're scheduled. So, if you transmit while somebody else is transmitting, uh, you will collide and uh, the radios are half duplex so you can't hear the other side and so you'll have packet loss. So you need the slot scheduled 
um, and we're able to do that uh, using some techniques that I'm not allowed to give out just yet. Um, but use the hardware, using the hardware, um, and uh, we're able to get very accurate uh, synchronization. So the system itself is self-configuring. I've done 802.11 um, uh, modifications so that there's actually uh, protocol uh, messages, uh, actually information elements in the beacons that are transmitted so you can identify TDMA networks. Uh, the networks, the, the TDMA network itself, uh, can coexist with an 802.11 network in terms of recognizing uh, overlap with 802.11 networks, moving off channel, uh, coordinating with other 802.11 networks, and, and uh, sort of cloaking itself so that uh, regular 802.11 stations don't try and join it. Um, however, you can't have a TDMA network coexist with a regular 802.11 network on the same channel um, because the TDMA network will not honor CCA. It will not uh, uh, avoid joining, uh, transmitting when another station is already transmitting. And so you'll get high collision rates and uh, basically destroy the uh, effectiveness of the other networks. So uh, for our purposes, it's not really important. Uh, but for operation in crowded, crowded, crowded environments or where things are highly regulated, uh, that means that the TDMA implementation is not, uh, is not really an option. It has to be really out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, <clears throat> part of the work that we did was to make sure that that stuff is, uh, is aware of other networks and get out the channel when it sees overlap. So. Um, that's really all I have to say about what we've done. What, um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the test deployments. Um, there have been several deployments, uh, some successful, some not so successful. The most recent one uh, in Venezuela was actually highly successful, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm just going to uh, give you a brief list of uh, deployments that we did. Uh, this is RCP, not TIER. And then I'm going to show you a slideshow of uh, some of the TIER work. Um, so, we've done some deployments in the Bay Area. Um, most of those are uh, between hilltops, um, although there have been some up-down kind of links. Uh, you have to remember wireless doesn't go through obstructions like mountains and stuff like that, so when you want to do multipoint, you have to go to the top of the mountain and then down again. Um, we did some test installations in Ghana in the refugee camps where they had to go over hills, so they had multi-hop, multi-point uh, transitions. Uh, those, those had mixed results. Um, we have some stations in South Africa, which I don't know a whole lot about, but it's a multi-station, again, relay involved. Um, in Panama, there's a pretty short point-to-point -point connection, which is actually doing quite well, apparently. That's running in 11A. And then the most recent tests um, were actually super long distance down in Venezuela. And uh, we were able to run some really impressive tests over 279 kilometers um, with uh, full bandwidth, of six megabits uh, bi-directional, three to four megabits in each direction, and uh, that's one of the ones I'm going to show pictures of. So I'm going to switch to this uh, to the slideshow. All right, so um, these are uh, slides from oh, yeah, there we go. Slides from uh, trials that uh, the tier people did. The first slides are from installations in the Bay Area. Uh, for those who are familiar, there's a, a naval station at Point Richmond. Uh, UC Berkeley and Intel arranged access. Uh, so some of the very first towers that they raised and installations that they did uh, were in the Bay Area out at Point Richmond. So this is the tier guys. Um, these are all graduate students at UC Berkeley who are erecting towers. It actually took them three tries uh, to get the towers up and working properly. Um, and of course, this is all experience that they used then. Uh, to do deployments in other places, uh, like overseas. Uh, so as you can see, this is all very hands-on. Um, there's a lot of stuff that was built in the machine shops at the Intel lab. Uh, things like cable uh, uh, connectors that, that had to be handmade and stuff. Uh, I, I wasn't involved in any of this. This was uh, part of the group that uh, was doing stuff before I showed up at the lab. And of course, this is everyone proudly standing in front of their tower after it's uh, been erected after the third try. Um, some of the guys that I'm going to talk about later uh, are in this picture. Um, there, there are uh, two people from uh, TIER that were uh, significantly involved in the, uh, in, in the RCP project. Matt Podolsky 
uh, did all the web GUI development and has been a mainstay in our project. And another uh, person of tier, uh, Rabin Patra, uh, was a big help as well in some of the protocol design. This is actually on top of the Intel building in downtown Berkeley. Intel has uh, a suite on the top level in the penthouse of the Power Bar building in downtown Berkeley. And you can see there's a sweeping vistas of the Bay Area. You can see this is the Golden Gate Bridge. It's pretty hard to see given the uh, cloud cover and so on. But off to the right is the Golden Gate Bridge. This is a view of Mount Tam uh, from the top of the building. And they set up towers, they set up antennas on top of the building uh, to, court, uh, to communicate with Point Richmond. Um, here's some of the grad students setting up stuff. I have edge fear, so I'd never go up there or go anywhere near any of this stuff. But uh, as you'll see later on, there's some pictures of some pretty impressive stunts that people have been climbing things. So again, these are directional antennas. These are high gain directional antennas. Uh, mounted directly behind the antennas are the boxes. Uh, you want cables as short as possible, okay, not only uh, to minimize loss on the cable, but also because of lightning strike. You have to take into account a lot of environmental conditions when you put up these things outside. As you can see the cinder blocks there. Um, so here's some slides of uh, the top of uh, my colleague, Kevin Fall, his roof. He's got quite a few antennas up there. Um, this is Rabin and Michael Rosenblum again. Um, they're sitting on top of the roof training antennas off to uh, Point Richmond Station, I believe. Um, I think the distance to there is, is probably uh, less than 30 kilometers. That's not too far. Um, here's some slides, uh, top of Mount Tamalpais over in Marin. Uh, they have a lockbox at the top of the tower, uh, at the top of the mountain. Um, and they can set up antennas. This one's just sitting on, on a uh, uh, tripost. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they have for uh, complete installation. This might have just been doing for a trial. Um, there's some people that live in uh, Marin that have uh, houses up on the hills with, uh, with installations. Uh, this is uh, a set of trials that were done in Guinea-Bissau uh, in Africa. Um, this area is uh, once again, an example of an emerging region. Uh, there's not a lot of money there for uh, putting in infrastructure, so they're looking for uh, ways to deploy, uh, you know, networking that are low cost. Uh, this gives you a flavor of what it's like in that area. Um, when you're out there doing installations, <coughs> you're, you're really on your own. Um, they might have a handheld spectrum analyzer like this, the Sanritsu analyzer, looking at the spectrum for noise and so on. Um, but you really don't have a whole lot of tools. This is a, a shot from the top of the tower looking down. Um, you remember I've, I've mentioned several times that once you put these boxes up, you don't want to have to go up there to work on them again. Um, this is the uh, control room area. The guy working has uh, soldering iron and some other stuff. It turns out it's shared with the radio station, the local radio station. Another issue that you have when you're doing these deployments is power. Um, these guys are running uh, the laptop off the car radio uh, off the car batteries, rather. Um, here's another picture from the top of the tower. Um, looking down on the village, you can see what the environment's like. Um, so, once again, this is in Guinea-Bissau. I think this was uh, mid to late 2006. And there's the radio station uh, where they left the controls for the, uh, for the wireless setup that was up the tower. Um, I think this stuff is still in use, but I don't know. So, this is the last set of uh, trials that was done. Uh, this is in Venezuela. Uh, there were uh, four test installations that were done. This is the first side, uh, erecting the tower, uh, uh, erecting the, the mast with the high gain antenna at the first uh, point. <coughs> uh, Rabin, uh, Rabin Patra was uh, the tier person uh, involved. Uh, there's a group of people in South America um, who, uh, who sponsored uh, the work. Uh, you can see Rabin's on the left. Uh, they use whatever tools they have to get the antennas up. Uh, this side was, uh, I don't recall exactly which side, but this is the view over the valley to the far side where they're going to put the other tower. Um, the first test installation that was put up was 279 kilometers, and later on they put some other ones up. Uh, as you can see, the conditions are not the best. Uh, there they are huddled over a spectrum analyzer, uh, it's pretty wet out there. Rabin's got his, uh, uh, and, and it got even wetter. This is uh, running tests, link tests, over 279 kilometers using a laptop in the rain. Must be foggy. Um, yeah, I don't remember exactly what they used. Uh, this is the next morning. It started to get cold. Um, 
So, as I said, they were able to get uh, 3 to 4 megabits a second. They ran 11B, so it couldn't have been 2.4. It had to be 2.4. Um, you can see the antenna set up. Uh, the second installation that they did uh, was 382 kilometers, and uh, you're going to see this coming up next. <clears throat> when they set that up, they were up higher, and the conditions got even colder. Um, this is Rabin standing, uh, posing with stuff. As you can see, it's pretty spectacular up there on top of the mountains, uh, and the weather is, is kind of inhospitable. Um, the, the longer distance trial, um, here he is. Uh, this, is, this is actually the 382 uh, distance uh, trial. Uh, Rabin said that's uh, zero degrees C right there uh, when he ran the test. This is the morning after uh, with the sun coming up over the hills. Um, so at 382 kilometers they were able to get uh, nearly identical results as at 2 and 79. Um, but uh, the RCP box apparently didn't work, but the tier box did. So we need to look at the results to understand why. And uh, these are just more photos. Oh, the last thing they did was, uh, this is Rabin carrying the, the, uh, the antenna up the hillside. They decided they were going to try 400 kilometers. So trying to, trying to carry this stuff up at that altitude is uh, non-trivial. They set it up at the top of the mountain um, and tried it uh, 400 kilometers, but apparently it didn't work. I don't know exactly what the problems were. So, <clears throat> anyway, uh, here they are standing proud with uh, their installation at 400 kilometers. Um, and uh, I think these results are, are really quite spectacular. Um, uh, this is them packing up to go. So, uh, by comparison, um, the, uh, the long distance uh, uh, record, official long distance record, I think was done at DEF CON a couple years ago. And that was only, uh, I don't remember, but it was, it was a significantly shorter distance. So, okay, so. Um, I'm going to go back real quick um, to uh, finish the slides. There's just a couple more slides. So I can yeah. keep going. Okay. Yeah, uh, of what the project was like and um, what the difficulties were and 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 what we did. Um, we were. Uh, I'm actually going to go back to doing some more work on this project um, here in the fall. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing, the, uh, there's, a, there's a person at the Intel Research Lab who's got a project going on with steerable antennas, and we're going to integrate uh, his steerable antenna work uh, with the RCP. Uh, you can find information about the, uh, the work that he's done, Alan Manwaring, uh, on the web, I'm sure. Uh, and also, if you go to the Intel Research Lab, uh, I'm sure there's papers that describe the work. Um, one of the experiences, one of the things we learned from some of the trials, a lot of this stuff is is work in progress. Um, setting up relay installations is, is really kind of hard. Um, when you have multiple radios and you have to figure out which antenna goes in which direction and, and getting things lined up and trained, um, plus getting traffic routed through and stuff, it turns out it's, it's actually quite complicated. Uh, so we're going to work on, uh, on the relay, uh, on, on the systems that are acting as relays. That is, they have multiple radios, multiple point-to-point -point radios, and they're acting as uh, part of the backbone. Um, the current RCP box, uh, as I said, the focus has been production quality uh, for uh, sort of uh, foolproof deployment. Um, we haven't incorporated all of the work from TIER, uh, but we're going to look at incorporating some of that, like the bulk axe in particular. And possibly uh, the TIER people have also looked at uh, multi-radio scheduling so that you try and synchronize the TDMA slots so, um, <clears throat> so that if you uh, want to operate multiple radios in the 2.4 band, uh, something I haven't discussed, um, you can ensure you don't have collisions between uh, multiple radios running simultaneously. Because um, uh, you, you can't do that. Uh, anyway, another thing I want to look at is that there are new Atheros parts for, that support 802.11n that have uh, more hardware capabilities, including finer grain, uh, higher resolution timers, which will allow us to do better TDMA slot calculations. Um, we might also be able to uh, leverage uh, the block act support in hardware uh, for doing block acting of the TDMA uh, transmits. Um, one, of the, one of the key things that we came up with, um, we sort of knew all along, but became all the more clear from experiences, was that when you're setting up these systems, a really, really hard thing that's really critical 
is being able to uh, set these directional antennas in the right direction, um, optimally pointed where you want them to be. And um, we, we have some ideas about how to build systems uh, using sound uh, that can help us uh, do that. Um, it, it's really not a, a hard problem, but it's something that's, that's lacking from our system that we think will really help in terms of deployment. Um, and last, uh, one of the things that we've, we've talked about doing is, uh, is trying to integrate our system uh, you know, with existing uh, mesh implementations like uh, the stuff for OLPC, the Meraki networks and stuff, so we can act as a backbone and tie into existing mesh networks. So um, this work, you know, I've talked about work, a lot of the work obviously is not my work. Uh, the RCP work is my work. Um, there are a lot of people who have contributed significantly, they're listed here. Uh, the people at the lab, uh, Intel lab, that I've worked with are listed. Uh, Kevin Fall and Eric Brewer are in charge. Uh, the UC Berkeley Tier Project. Uh, Gateworks, where the, where the boards came from, the prototype boards, Ryan Ellsworth was a big help. And uh, Jim Thompson at NetGate helped uh, with other things. Uh, and Ubiquity has been very uh, kind in donating cards and providing samples for test and evaluation. So the, the last question, which I'm sure everyone wants, and, and uh, I, I didn't not go to Copenhagen because of that, uh, uh, is that uh, uh, can we get this stuff? Um, first of all, uh, this is not a product. I have to say it multiple times. This is not a product. Uh, this is a research prototype, um, and uh, the availability is unknown. Um, the TDMA implementation uh, I've described um, uses all publicly available components. You can do it yourself um, with a little thought. Um, and if someone wants to try, I'm more than happy to help them. Um, I can't give out the code that I have, but I can certainly help people try and do it themselves. Um, so the, the one question is, uh, is probably, other than this is uh, kind of neat, uh, what does it have to do with a BSD conference? Um, <clears throat> well, all I can say is that, um, is that if we move forward, um, there's a very good chance that instead of using Linux, uh, the RCP platforms may be BSD based and uh, there's, there's no reason uh, why uh, Linux was simply there because at the time uh, FreeBSD and the other, the other BSD systems didn't work on it and there are some advantages to Linux uh, for our needs in terms of uh, the grad students familiarity with it and so on uh, but in the future this may turn out to be a BSD based uh, system as well. Anyway, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed.